far we did uh, some exciting journey we seen how the israelites were delivered from a from the land of egypt and they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years and then they reached the promised land and we saw how a believer's life is compared comparable to the same kind of journey where we are delivered from this world from the world of sin and god takes us through this wilderness to remove all the egypt from within our lives and to take us into that intimacy and how we'll one day reach our, reach our promised land, which is heaven itself, as God is preparing for each and every believer. It's a wonderful promise and a wonderful hope for every believer. So our focus is this one aspect in the wilderness where God said, build me a dwelling place that I can dwell among you. He told the Israelites to build a tabernacle. He came and literally dwelt. His glory was there seen visible to everybody around the tabernacle. It was a marvelous sight. Only something we could imagine and some people tried to paint it, but nobody can do a justice to God's glory. How can we paint God's glory? It was a marvelous sight, must be a marvelous sight. And through this tabernacle, God wanted to teach them three things primarily. And number one, he wanted to teach them that he's, that he's a loving God who longs for fellowship with human beings. He longs for fellowship with his creation. That's the first thing that he taught. Number two, he taught what the holiness of his being is. How he is holy and how we are not holy and how we are sinful. So and how to restore this fellowship. That's the second thing he taught. And the third thing that God tried to show through the tabernacle is the one way of salvation that comes through Christ and Christ alone. Believe it or not, every element in this tabernacle points to Jesus Christ. Every element in this tabernacle points to Jesus Christ. If you look at the structure, it's 150 feet long and 70, 75 feet wide. There are million, close to million Israelites. It's not a big enough courtyard or outer courts for people to gather, but it's good enough for people to come in and bring sacrifice and for them to understand the, the, the nature of God himself and his kingdom. So in this courtyard, and the, uh, there's some enclosure that is right within, which is uh, 45 feet long, and 15 feet wide and the height is 15 feet as, as well it's called uh, it's, it's made up of two components two rooms that are separated one is called the holy place and the next is called the most holy place or the holy of holies the holy place is right next to something called the labor which we talked about last week if any part of this series if you miss it I urge you and I plead you to listen to this sermon online because there's a chain of sequence of uh, uh, teaching that you, I don't want you to miss. But still you can get components even if you come for the first time, it's okay. You'll still get something out of the sermon. But there's a sequence and a pattern that I want you to learn. So this is uh, the next thing is a holy place, 30 feet by 15 feet right next to the labor. And right next to the holy place is the most holy place of the Holy of Holies, 15 feet wide, 15 feet uh, uh, in length, and 15 feet tall. It's a cube, uh, it's a cubical structure where the Ark of the Covenant is and where the glory of the Lord dwelt. In the book of Revelation, which we'll talk about sometime when we come to the Holy of Holies aspect, uh, the kingdom that God is preparing, the dimensions of the place as a cubical structure. So, and the glory, and the, the atmosphere in heaven is God's glory. So imagine dwelling in the glory of God, and that's the pattern that God showed way back in the Old Testament. So, so it's an amazing structure, and we saw all this uh, outline for uh, how God gave, them, gave the instructions to Moses to build. We also saw a couple of structures so far in this series. We saw the altar of the burnt offering, which symbolizes Christ himself, and how uh, he was the offering and the sacrifice once and for all. And the next we saw labor. We saw how labor signifies and symbolizes the word of God. And today I'm going to talk uh, uh, about something else which is in the outer courts. It's the fence. So my whole sermon, believe it or not, is just about this fence. Okay? You think I don't have much to talk about. Believe me, I can talk. That's why I married a girl who doesn't talk much. Right? It's hot water needs cold water. And chemists know that acid needs a base, right? And that's a good combination. So guys are talkative, find a girl who doesn't talk much. But even if she says a few words, they make a lot of sense. They say I have to carry the same meaning to the hundred words I say, right? So it's very, it's very important to understand this component on the outer courts, the linen fence, and let's try to understand 
what this linen fence is all about. When God gave the instructions to Moses, this is what he said about the linen fence in Exodus chapter 27 from verses 19 to 18. 9 to 8. 9 to 18, sorry. You shall also make a coat of the tabernacle for the south side shall be the hangings of, for the coat made of fine woven linen. Sorry, the two V's and W's there is confusing. All right, woven linen, 100 cubits long on one side, and its 20 pillars and the 20 sockets shall be of bronze. The hooks of the pillars and the bands shall be of silver. Likewise, along the length of the north side, there shall be hangings of 100 cubits long with 20 pillars, so 20 sockets of bronze, and the hooks for the pillars of the bands of silver. And along the width of the court of the west, west side shall be hangings of 50 cubits with 10 pillars and, ten, and their 10 sockets. The width of the court on the east side shall be 50 cubits. And uh, 50 cubits, the hangings on one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. And on the other side shall be the hangings of 15 cubits with, uh, uh, with their three pillars and three sockets. For the gate of the court shall be a screen of 20 cubits long, a woven of blue, purple, scarlet thread, and woven of fine linen made by the weaver. It shall be four pillars and four sockets. All the pillars around the court shall have bands of silver, and the hooks shall be of silver, and the sockets of bronze. And the length of the court shall be 100 cubits, the width 50 throughout, and the height 5 cubits, made of five, fine woven again. Man, this word is coming again and again. Linen and the sockets of bronze. So this is the instruction. So I said, God just spent three chapters on creation in Genesis. And here by little bits here in Asia and Psalms and stuff. But he spent 50 chapters just on tabernacle. It's very amazing that he spent all these details in the scripture. And you think it's a waste of space. But there's a huge implication for every believer that we'll try to see. So here is a courtyard. It's a large rectangular area enclosed by a linen fence. There is no roof, and of course it's lighted by the sunlight. And the most important thing for us to focus on, it's this, this fence is made up of finely twisted linen. And uh, when, the, when the viewer or the Nisraelite looks at a tabernacle, look, imagine this structure, it's five cubits, I told you about the measurements, it's approximately seven and a half feet high. So this structure, 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, and you're standing outside and you're looking at it, the major color that you'll see is white. It's surrounded by whiteness, and the person is trying to look at it and try to comprehend what this is all about. As a logical question for us to ask, if God is dwelling inside that enclosure or the structure within, the structure that you see, the tabernacle building proper, why does he need a fence? Isn't that a good question? So why does he need a fence? The main thing, my friends, God is holy. What is the meaning of the word holy? Many of us think um, holiness is purity. But the primary meaning of the, word of ho uh, meaning of the word holy is separation. What God is holy means God is separate. Separate from what? Separate from sin, sub separate from any kind of uncleanness. And when this tabernacle is built, where his, his glory dwelled amidst them, the fence separated God from the world. The world is shut out for God, and God is shut in from the world. The fence separated his entire being. So what does this linen fence symbolize? The symbolism of the linen fence is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. We'll try to understand a little bit what righteousness is all about. But imagine, there's no way a person can climb over God's righteousness to have fellowship with him. A sinner who is in the world, he's shut out from God completely because of God's righteousness that surrounds this dwelling place. So even the gross sinner or even the self-righteous man who thinks he is God or he is like God, there's no way for him to climb over the fence and enter except through one opening called the gate. Interesting. So let's look to a little bit about the pillars that hold up the fence. There are uh, 20 pillars on the north side, 20 pillars on the south side. These pillars are made up of wood and they're uh, surrounded or overlaid with bronze. And the sockets where the pillars stood 
but also made up of bronze. On the top of the pillars were uh, caps of silver. And these pillars were tied down with ropes and uh, with hooks and stakes that are planted into the ground. So 20 pillars on the north, 20 pillars on the south, the 10 pillars on the west side, and the east side is the entrance. The only place on the east side is the entrance. And uh, there are three pillars on either side of the gate, and the gate itself consisted of four pillars. So what are these pillars all about? What is the linen fence all about? The symbolism of these bronze pillars Bronze signifies the judgment of God. Anybody who tries to climb over God's righteousness will be prone to God's judgment. In fact, he's, he's barring people away from coming to have fellowship with God. That is strange, isn't it? Here is God saying, no way you can come over my righteousness. If you try to come, you'll be prone to judgment because of the bronze that you see there. The great lessons within this little structure here, let's try to understand what this means. A sinful man is forbidden from approaching God except through the gate he provided. The walls are too high to climb and there's only one prescribed way to come in to God's presence is through the main entrance. So what are God's righteous standards. What is God's righteousness? What is righteousness? Righteousness means being right. So what are God's ways or standards that he set to humans to be right? In order to understand that, the answer lies in the key word called the law of God. There are 613 commandments in the Old Testament which is called the law of God. It's not just the ton commandments that we know. Thou shall not steal, uh, you know, no jealousy, envy, you know, idol worship, adultery. There's so many things that God listed. You shall not do, you shall not do, you shall not do. So the list goes on and on and on. And they say, the scholars say, there's 613 laws that God forbids you from doing. And if you violate that law of God, that's what is called sin. Simple. If you break the law of God, you commit what is called sin. So why did God give all these laws anyway? Because he wanted to show his nature that is a holy God and we are sinful beings and we cannot come together without a mediator, without a substitute in between. That's the reason why God gave these righteous standards. And the scripture we see, the fence of God's law. Remember this, the fence, the righteous fence, the righteousness of God is God's law. We can understand God's standards by understanding the law of God. James 2.10 says this, Whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at one point is guilty of all. God doesn't say, oh, there are 613 laws. If you do 600, if you can make it to 600, you're fine. If you make it to 599, maybe. There are no maybes with God, my friends. It's either black or white. It's light or darkness. Is that if you break one law, you're guilty of all. That's hard, isn't it? So how can we approach God? Can we approach God? It's like with, your, with our self-righteousness. I'm a right being. I, 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 I'm a good guy. I can approach God. If you say that, Bible says in Isaiah 64.6, but we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. All our righteous acts, God says, are like filthy rags. God doesn't expect, God doesn't accept human's righteousness, a man's self-righteousness. It has to be according to his law because he set the rules, not us setting the rules. There's a big mistake, my friend, nowadays. When you see TV, I look at some basketball players or something. Sometimes, sometimes when they come up, they say, Oh, I thank God. Or they win an Oscar award. I thank God, a Grammy. I thank God for... They just throw that word. And immediately, we Christians, we believers in Christ, we say, Oh man, that guy must be a believer or a Christian. What a great testimony. It doesn't matter what the guy does in his music or in his secular lifestyle. You know, all this filthy mouth when he was playing the basketball. As soon as he mentions God, we try to find some good things that make him godly. There's a difference between goodness and godliness, my friend. We can be self-righteous. A good man, just because he gave a million dollars as a donation to Africa, doesn't make him a godly man. 
All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. All your righteous acts are like filthy rags, God says. So why was this law given? If God is a loving God, He wants us to have, wants us to have fellowship with Him, why did He give the law which is really impossible to keep anyway? Why does He exclude us and why does He make our life harder? Isn't, uh, he should provide a way for us to approach Him, doesn't He? But the law has barred sinners from coming to the Lord, coming to the Lord. And every act that we do in the flesh, the Bible calls it sin. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh just be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The purpose of the linen fence, the purpose why God kept the fence is simple. When you try to come to enter the tabernacle, to have fellowship with God, you see the righteous standards of God, and all of a sudden you try to get over the fence with our righteous self-righteousness, you can't do it because you'll be prone to judgment. And then you think, okay, what is the means? Then you start evaluating and become conscientious about something. Like in order to have fellowship, I need to cross the fence, and God brings something called sin and the knowledge of sin happens because of the fence, because of the law. Got the picture? Am I clear here? God gives us the knowledge of sin. Nobody can say, I'm sinless, because the law is very hard to keep anyway. So once we have knowledge of the sin, that the purpose of the law, the reason why God gave the law is to give us the consciousness or the, uh, the awareness of sin in our lives and there's no way to approach God. That's the purpose of the law. Man, that doesn't sound hopeful either. So what's the cure? Galatians 3.24 Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Uh-huh. So we know the disease, we know the symptoms, sin, law, all the hardship, it's hard to approach God, hard to have fellowship with Him. So what do we do? The law says it's a schoolmaster. You begin to walk along the fence, try to see how can I get in. And what do you see? A gate. The law leads us to the entrance, and the entrance, Bible says, is Christ and Christ alone. And when you look at that entrance, all you see is Christ, which we'll look at in a little bit. And then immediately, we put our faith in Christ, and then you can have fellowship with God. That is the purpose of the law. The law makes us helpless. And unless you are as good as he is, we cannot climb over the fence and enter his glory and it leads to our salvation because we need to get through the entrance. You know, I was thinking about why is the law so hard? It's almost like I tried to set an example. I built this thing. I'm not a handy guy. I tried to put in the doors. As you guys know, see the doors are so awkward. There's so many of them that I had to put in. But imagine there are doors, okay? Don't laugh at that. Thank you. I said, don't laugh. Thank you. All right. So there are the doors. There's a building. A guy is in there. Say there are 613 doors, 613 laws. And all these doors are locked. Except there's one door. The 614th door is the door that's red in color. And it says exit on top. How much intelligence do we need to say that says exit? Out of all these doors, that's the door I should choose. Simple, isn't it? That is God's strategy. All, and if we go and try opening every door, try forcing it open, we try, we, we try and try and try but keep failing, what does that make us? It's like you're trying on your self-righteous, oh, I can get through some other means. If you try to be self-righteous, you will fail. And God clearly marked a door for you. That is Christ and Christ alone. All you got to do is open and walk through. How simple is that? I was thinking how hard it is to keep the law. So last night, after doing my prayer late at night, I was just coming into my bedroom. It's so hard to get into my bedroom. While Sarah's sleeping, everything is dark. And I try not to make any noise. You know, he tried to keep the law. He tried not to make any noise. The first thing is to kick a water bottle. 
right? And then I tried to sit there, try to get the headphones, and there's a drawer right next to my bed. I tried to open it slowly, but it makes like a loud rumbling noise. I don't know how to deal with that. And Sarah is sleeping. But I tried to do it slow. Should I do it fast so that it'll be in one time and it's done? Or should I do it slowly? And then there is a craving for a can- I keep a little bit of candy right next to me. There's a craving for candy. And what I do is at 11.30, I pick out one Jolly Rancher. And I try to open the wrap, but Sarah... So any noise of a rapper, she'll wake up, right? So I try, then I try to smother it under the blankets and open the wrapper so that it doesn't make noise. And by the time, all of a sudden, she gets up, gives me that one look, let me tell you. And all my effort to keep the law is burned in a moment with that one look. And I feel so angry, it's like, and, and sometimes when I sneeze, she gets up, stop making noise. I can't control a sneeze. <laughs> the law is hard to keep, my friends. And that's my wife, right? But that's the hardship of keeping the law. And I said, this is impossible, Lord. And that's the last night's illustration. This is similar to God's way. God is telling to do this and do this and do this. And we try to achieve his standards and get over the fence. It doesn't work. Makes us helpless. But praise the Lord. There is a reason why. For what law could not do. That in that it was weak. Through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for my sin. He condemned in sin and flesh that the righteousness of the law, righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who uh, walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Praise the Lord. This scripture makes sense. When we understand that it's not me who can accomplish this but God and Christ and Christ alone. What a relief. The biggest barrier to overcome is the sin in life. And the only way we can overcome is through Christ and Christ alone. If we realize our sinful condition and understand that we can't achieve anything on our own effort, great news. You got hope because Christ paid the price for you anyway. The scripture continues to say, God is God's righteousness, God's righteousness. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become what? Righteousness of God. All of a sudden, you're declared holy because of what Christ has done, says the Bible. Romans 10, 1 to 3, this is what Paul is pleading with the Israelites. He says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved for I can testify about them that they're zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on the knowledge since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own and they did not submit to God's righteousness. If you want to achieve spiritual things on your own ability, my friends, I'm sorry, Paul says, you're a failure. But unless you submit, you cannot, it cannot happen. Self-righteousness is no good. This is a beautiful scripture, Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Simple thing. If you want deliverance from the law, all you got to do is put your faith and believe in Christ alone and you will be declared righteous in God's sight. How easy is that? Sometimes even spiritually we can be prideful and spiritually you can be self-righteous. Imagine a week without sinning. Sometimes when I fast and pray and stuff, I feel, okay, Lord, I prayed enough. I'm all holy. You better answer my prayer now. Right? That's how I feel like. It's like, okay, I did stuff here. That's pride. That's self-righteousness. Or I did it for you. Like the teenager said, I come to church just for my parents' sake. Hey, you're not doing them a favor. It's your soul that matters. You're doing yourself a favor by coming to church. You're not living for somebody else, my friend. Self-righteousness is no good. You cannot twist God's arm. His love for you will never change anyway. 
It's us who keep coming up and down. Sometimes when we are holy, we think we can pray. When, sometimes when we sin, we think, oh man, yes, blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. But sometimes we don't understand how to take God's forgiveness either. And I say, maybe I'm not good, maybe he won't listen. That is pride. Absolute pride. Bible says if you're faithful to just confess your sin, he'll forgive you. So what's wrong with that? Don't, do not underestimate the work of the cross, my friend. It is powerful. First, Second Corinthians 1.30 says this. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has, made, uh, who has become for us the wisdom of God that is our righteousness and holiness and redemption. Sometimes people ask, why do bad things happen to good people? R.C. Sproul's answer, I said that before. He says, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer because I haven't met any good people yet. Nobody is good, my friend. We are all sinners, but thank goodness to Christ, we are declared righteous and holy and godly. What, a, what an easy way. Let's move on. You see this fence. It is five cubits in height and has 60 pillars in total. Five into 12, 60 pillars. 12 represents the family of God. 12, the number 12 represents in the Bible the family of God, the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, five represents the beginning of life, which I talked about in the, when I was talking about the altar of sacrifice. Five, on the day five, the creation of life happened. So what does this mean? When you enter into the courts, the outer court, you are in the family of God. The people outside the fence, they're lost in the world. And your new life begins within. Also, this fence is held by hooks and stakes, and these hooks and stakes are made up of silver. Interestingly, the cap that you see is made of silver. The pegs are made of silver. The material of the rope is not described. But each pillar is joined by silver beams as well. This would give the strength in the desert, in the wilderness, with heavy winds and gusts and all these storms. The pillars held the linen fence together. But the silver in the Bible talks about redemption. Every time you see the word silver in the Bible, it talks about God's redemption. So what's happening here? A sinner comes to the fence. Here, picture this with me. He wants to get over this, this fence or get into the fellowship with God, but he can't achieve it. This bronze here, which talks about judgment. Linen talks about God's righteousness. So how can he pass? He can see the silver pegs and the silver cap and he say, wait a minute. There is a path for redemption. What a message. All throughout the fence they can see that there is a path for redemption because of the silver. The pillars represent individually a believer, a Christian. A believer in Christ and there's another believer in Christ standing next to each other. And the only way that we can hold together of God's righteousness is by having that redeeming silver beam joining each, each other. The only way we can be strengthened in fellowship is, is fellowship. So righteousness, the linen fence, getting over it is achieved through Christ. And the strength for each and every believer is, occurs through fellowship, standing there with each other. So my friends, you cannot be a lonely Christian. You cannot be a lonely Christian. Let's get into the entrance of that gate, the entrance of the tabernacle. For the gate of this court shall be the hanging of 20 cubits of blue, purple, scarlet, and finely twisted linen, wrought with, wrought with the needlework, and their pillars shall be four, and their sockets shall be four. So this is the, uh, Jesus said, I am the gate, whoever enters through me shall be saved. Interesting. That's one of his New Testament statements. And probably had this in mind, a, a picture of a tabernacle when he was speak, speaking it. But he uses it in the illustration of a sheep and a shepherd. So Jesus says he is the door. He's the, anybody who can enter is only through him. And he also, Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only few find it. If you look at the fence, it's huge, but there's only a small, narrow entrance to get in. So my friends, everything in the fence 
points to Jesus Christ. So we see this gate is made up of four colors. That's a modern day representation, but I didn't know how it looked like probably. They, it's woven together with a material which is dyed of linen. It's blue, it has blue in it, it has scarlet in it, it has purple as well as white in color. So this is how the gate is made. So blue represents heaven. It says that Christ, everything points to Christ again, as I said. So the blue represents that God, Christ himself, his origin and his nature is heavenly. Scarlet talks about the sacrifice, how Christ became the sacrifice, the color of the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Purple, interestingly, is the significance of royalty. You know how purple comes? It's a combination of blue and scarlet together. A, a blue, a heavenly being, the son of God, son of man, is the royalty, is the king, king of all kings. That's what the Bible says. And white signifies the righteousness again. So here is a person who just walks to this gate with his sacrifice. As all as he's, as he's seeing these colors, as he's the entrance of the gate with his sacrifice, he's seeing Christ himself and the message of the cross itself right there in the fence. And the message with the colors, you see the sequence, it's amazing. A God who inhabited heaven became a sacrifice for our sins, through which he became a king and a priest, royalty, through whom we can achieve the righteousness. See the gospel right there in the fence? Amazing. So here is the people, here's the person who brings all these things. He can see, see the picture of God himself. Another thing we should see is this gate itself is held by four pillars. Four pillars are holding this gate. So the four pillars represent the four gospels. Here is an amazing picture. Four pillars holding the message of Christ, displaying it to the people in this world. The four gospels. Let me explain a little better. Christ is portrayed in Matthew as a king. In Mark, he was portrayed as a servant. In Luke, he was a son of man. In John, he was portrayed as a son of God. And look at the colors of the gospel. Matthew, the king, the purple, signifies royalty. Mark, a suffering servant, a human who was bled to death, that talks about the scarlet color. Luke, the son of man who's righteous, it's white in color. And John, calling him the son of God, is blue, talking about heaven. See the significance? And you move on. And during the time of Christ, there are four kinds of people that existed in the land of Palestine. The Romans, the Greeks, the Jews, and the rest of the world. The new believers in Christ later on existed. So for a Jew, God is light. They were waiting for the king, the Messiah. That's why they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They expected Jesus Christ to overthrow the Roman Empire and establish his throne in Jerusalem. That's why they got excited. So they were waiting for the king. So Matthew wrote the gospel for the Jewish people to portray Christ as the king. Mark, he wrote for the Romans. For Roman, the key word is glory. Strength, that's Roman thing. Glory is a Roman term. For Romans, when Mark wrote this, he presented Christ as a suffering servant, a humble, ordinary man who was the savior of the whole world. And Luke he presented the gospel to Greek. For a Greek person, uh, philosophy is of the essence during those days. They wanted knowledge, righteousness, this perfect being. That's what they seeked for. The Greek person with all these symposiums, they spend their time just sitting and talking in Colossians. That's what they did. So for them, Luke wrote this gospel and he presented Christ as the son of man, as the perfect human being, free from all sin, as a righteous man who wears white, if you know what I mean, figuratively. And John presented the gospel to the whole world, how he is the son of God. So here is a, is, is a complete picture. The Lenin fence says, stay out. And people tried to get in, they said, stay out. But they had one entrance, and that entrance said, come in. And the only way you can come in is through the gate. And Jesus said, he summed it up, my friend, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's only one way we can approach God. I keep saying this again and again. I come from a land of 33 million gods. 33 million. Can you imagine? Out of all that, Jesus is the only way. The devil 
tries to take you out in different directions, show you different pathways to get to God. And it says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end leads to death. But praise God that Christ is the only way that we can achieve. So here is a summary. If there is a creation, there is a creator. And if there is a creator, he is a designer himself of you and me. It's like if there is a king, there is a kingdom. So what does our king expect from our lives? He said he gave the law for us. The king gave us the law. And the law we couldn't keep. But he also provided a way of salvation. And it is Christ and Christ alone. My friends, if you want to be saved, there is no other way than Jesus Christ himself. Otherwise, outside the fence, you're lost in eternal darkness, in the wilderness, and you're doomed forever. That's the, that's the gospel message here. And the final snippet I want to tell you. It took 1,500 square cubits of material to build this linen fence all around. If you measure it, it's 1,500 cubit, uh, uh, square cubits of material. And it was approximately 1,500 years after the construction of the tabernacle that Christ came. What, a, what an equation. But this same Christ who came before is coming back for us again. And this is what the Bible says in the book of Revelation. Chapter 19, verse 6 to 8. Then I heard the sound like a great multitude, like the roar of the rushing waters, like loud uh, uh, peals of thunder and shouting. Hallelujah, for the Lord God our Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Does it make sense now? We will be declared righteous and we'll be in the presence of the Lord. We are the bride of Christ. My friends, here is the question. Do you want to be a part of this kingdom? I'm excited. I'm excited to be a believer. I'm excited that I have hope one day that he calls me righteous. What a great God we have. He did everything for us. Everything. That is a gospel message. See, I told you. You think you thought there was nothing to talk about offense, but see the amount of message that is there? And my friends, let me tell you, do not believe anything I say. Go and do your own research. All I'm doing is giving you outlines. And once you study the scriptures, once you like, when these treasures keep coming out, believe me, they're like explosions of volcanoes erupt in my heart every time I find something new. I rejoice and that becomes my prayer. You know what prayer should be, how God should alter your lifestyle. It's an art. So for example, when I was in biotechnology being a scientist, I was looking at a cell and the mechanism of DNA. And I said, Lord, thank you for the deoxyribose nucleic acid and the way of the double helical structure. And my prayers have changed because I've seen the God's glory in those little things. And once you see the scripture and see the marvelous thing in a linen fence, I get excited for a linen fence. The world thinks I'm crazy. But my friends, the gospel is clear and you can get excited too once you know the truth in it. That is the word of God and that will give you the essence to put your trust in him, put your faith in him. Because all throughout history, a period of 1800 years, 66 books, 40 different authors, they came together, put this thing together for you and me to see again and again. This is God's word in our hands, extraterrestrial in origin, for you to put, and, uh, put your faith in God's word and say, Lord, I believe. No matter what the situations are, no matter what the circumstances are, you proved again and again and you dispersed and scattered the message from hostile jamming and you made way for me to understand the integrity of your message and the beauty of this mystery and the marvelous words that you have prepared for me. And once you understand God's acts, God's nature, God's heart towards you, our lifestyle will change and we can live like true disciples who deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow him. And when we say, oh Lord, I love your cross, it'll mean a whole lot different once we have an understanding. I've been to church, sometimes when I go to uh, a youth conference or something, I will praise you, I'll worship, the kids are jumping, they're singing away and, and they say, Lord, I love you. And I say, I can only say, Lord, I love you so many times, my friends. I don't know about you. But I need something else to make me love God better. It's like a diamond. You look at it and say, wow, 
And you, you turn, oh wow, you see different reflections, different facets of God. And every time you look at him in a new dimension, your perspective of God changes. And all of a sudden, I don't even know what to say. Say, hmm, I love you. I get excited. That is a Christian walk. And somebody described me as a mechanic who gets excited for a car. Ah, that's a good description. I thought, your carburetor is broken. You know, no. This is how exciting it is, my friends. The word of God is alive. Study the word. You don't need me anymore. Day in and day out, you dwell on these riches. And you'll blossom in season and out of season. And nothing will smother your spirit. And God will lead you into all truth. And let your journey begin now, just like the Israelites did. Get into his glory. Get into his presence. Have an understanding. Breathe his glory. That's the atmosphere we need to dwell in day in and day out. That's the walk of a believer. That is a disciple. Remove yourself from all the detox that Christianity has taught you. Who said Christianity is right? The scriptures are right. People think, oh, uh, Kamal, isn't it hard to uh, do ministry in cross-cultural differences in Canada? Somebody interviewed me to ask this cross-cultural Canadian culture. I said, no, I believe in one culture that is biblical, biblical culture. Sin is sin in India and Canada as well. Believe it or not. So if we stick to the word of God, the same God that I preach, people in India still don't get it. They think this whole church is full of Indians because I'm an Indian guy. They think that they don't get it. It's all white people sitting here. Praise God for what you're doing, my friends. But the thing is, the word of the Lord will never change. And I preach in English, I'm not a speaker. I'm, I don't listen to my sermons, believe it or not, because I'm not a speaker. But praise God for His Word. It changes lives. I want to encourage you. I want to push you to such an extent. Start studying the snippets. Be a detective. Take your brush and your magnifying glass and start searching the scriptures. And believe me, when you find these treasures, it's better for you to find than somebody else showing you. How come that guy, from? I'll find myself. I challenge you, search yourself. Come up with something better than what I know. You say, come on, I'll tell you something that you don't know. I'll be the happiest guy.